everyone. I'm Kim Cogco with the ACA International in the Washington, D.C. office. ACA is the leading voice for the accounts receivable management industry. The content provided in this podcast is presented for educational and general reference purposes only. The content is not intended to serve as legal advice. Before we get started on today's podcast titled The CFPB's Proposed Rule, Peeling Back the Layers, I'd like to remind you that ACA has a deep dive webinar series on the CFPB rulemaking available on our website at www.acainternational.org under the Education tab. So back to today's ACA cast, which will be moderated by our board president, Jack Brown, who is an attorney and president of Gulf Coast Collection Bureau. So Jack will talk today with Eileen Bitterman, a compliance officer and shareholder with Weltman, Weinberg, and Reese, and Tim Collins, the chief compliance officer with True Accord. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Jack. Thanks so much, Kim. I'm excited to be here today with this esteemed panel to talk about the CFPB rules and rolling back the layers a little bit to dig into a little bit of some of the proposals that were rolled out last month by the CFPB. ACA has had a busy year leading up to the release of the proposed debt collection rules. Through the efforts of our members and staff, I feel ACA is doing an excellent job in communicating everything there is to know about the rules and to help our members succeed. Our association has developed a plan along with a timeline to ensure that when the rules were released that we would be ready to inform our members as well as answer any questions regarding the rules. In the lead up to the release, ACA was in constant contact with the Bureau to learn everything there was to know about what would be in the rules to anticipate our response. Part of the plan is to gather member feedback to incorporate into our comments that we'll be submitting to the CFPB. The comments are due by August 19, 2019. The Board of Directors was also proactive to ensure that we had outside counsel on retainer to assist with writing our comments to the rule. While ACA comments are an important part of the process, we also want to encourage all of our members to submit comments before the deadline to discuss areas of the rule that are of particular concern to them. Your comments don't have to cover all of the proposals. A little background on the process, the uh, CFPB issued its advance notice of proposed rulemaking back in November 2013, so we're almost approaching six years. In 2016, the initial outline of the proposals were released and the SABRIFA process was conducted. And that led us up to where we were last month, May 7, 2019, when the CFPB issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to implement the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Among other things, the rules would set clear, bright-line limits on the number of calls debt collectors may place to reach consumers on a weekly basis, clarify how collectors may communicate lawfully using newer technologies such as voicemail, emails, and text messages that have developed since the FDCPA's passage in 1977, and require collectors to provide additional information to consumers to help them identify debts and respond to collection attempts. The proposals released would establish clear, bright-line rules limiting call attempts and telephone conversations. They would also clarify consumer protection requirements for certain consumer-facing debt collection disclosures, as well as clarify how debt collectors can communicate with consumers. Using newer technologies, such as voicemails, emails, and text messages that were not around when the FDCPA was first passed. In addition to other items, including prohibitions on suits and threats of suit on time-barred debts and require communication before credit reporting. I had the pleasure to be with Eileen in Philadelphia last month when the CFPB released the proposed rules. Eileen, do you have any takeaways from that event in terms of the rulemaking process? Thank you, Jack. And I want to take a moment to thank ACA for inviting me to participate in today's podcast. And also to mention that I was honored to be invited to attend and participate in the CFPB town hall and roundtable that was held in Philadelphia last month. My takeaways were that the director was engaged and her staff and her team were interactive with both sides, the debt collection industry and the consumer side. I really feel that they were taking into account all the feedback from both sides that has been presented by both sides over the last several years as we have gone down this path of rulemaking. I also noted that they were acknowledging the various laws that will impact their rules. So the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, the court guidance that's been out there for years, and of course the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, 
And for companies like my firm, Weltman, Weinberg, and Reese, the state bars that govern us as debt collection lawyers. The focus is for these rules to help us to not be competitively disadvantaged and to kind of put a level playing field for everybody in the debt collection industry. There is a right to collect properly, and of course, there's consumer protection. One of the phrases I've been hearing a lot is the rules of the road. And I definitely saw that they were engaged with all interested parties. They were taking into account the comments being brought up at the roundtable by both the consumer side and by the debt collection industry. And obviously, the comments, as Jack has mentioned, this period from now until August 19th is going to be extremely important to our industry because communication is key, not just with a consumer, but with the Bureau as they're finalizing these rules in the hopes to give us the guidance that we've been looking for for so long. I have to agree, Eileen. I think one of the biggest takeaways that I had from that was that they really were listening to both sides' inputs and comments and asking uh, some great questions in response to that input. So thank you very much for that. Tim, one of the aspects of the rule that everyone has taken a close look at is the confirmed ability to use email and the different parameters around that. True Accord has been a leader in using text and email. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with that and how the rule will impact those procedures? Yeah, sure can, Jack. And I'd like to also thank ACA for having me here today. It's uh, definitely a privilege and an honor to be able to share what's going on, especially as it relates to the rule. Because there's a lot of um, no, there's a lot of pages to the rule, all 538 pages. <laughs> so, from an email perspective, you know, I agree with Eileen that there's definitely a lot of interaction with the CFPB. We've been talking to them for since I got here, and then even before that, I know Ohad was uh, our founder was talking to the CFPB about the use of email and why it's important that consumers have that ability to use that channel, that collection agencies and creditors have that same uh, access. So I think the CFPB really took the time to listen to what we were sharing with them, the effectiveness of email, the desire of consumers to be able to use that, and then incorporating that piece into the rule itself. Interestingly enough, our position has always been the FDCPA allows you to communicate through any medium when you look at the definition of communication. And it's nice that the CPB came out and said, specifically talks about email and the use of text messaging, giving us some clarification, almost a blessing, if you will, that this is the direction that we can go in. More effectively, I think, communicate with consumers, especially in light of that new FCC declaratory rule that just came out about uh, giving the phone providers the ability to block phone calls. It's going to become even more difficult for us to communicate with consumers. So using their consumer preference will be very important going forward in, in the debt collection industry. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I was at the uh, Sabrifa panel with OHUD back in uh, 2016, and you know one of the areas that the Bureau modified from the initial rules were it was initial just number of contacts. And, you know, there's really a question of, when you get into a text message type situation, how long in between communications or, or a sent text versus a received text, would that be considered a communication? So I see that the Bureau, you know, went back to their limit of phone attempts and phone conversations in the rule. But I certainly think that's one area that some folks should take a look at uh, when they're writing their comments. And I know the consumer groups will be talking about that. I had a uh, person after the Philadelphia meeting say, you know, that some of the consumer positions being advocated that this is an unlimited, like, cellular plan with unlimited text and emails and, and talk. So certainly something that we we might want to look at in another area that's within there is the uh, the differentiation between the work and the personal emails that's outlined in the rules. I think that's something that our members should take particular note of and, and pay some attention to that and think about how that might affect their operations. Eileen, recently I read a letter signed by over a dozen progressive Senate Democrats about the rule stating that creating an exemption for limited content messages that could be overheard on a voicemail or delivered to third parties like an employer is an invasion of basic privacy that should not be endorsed by the Bureau. Do you agree with this? And alternatively, are there any consumer benefits that you can think of that may come from a limited content voicemail? I had the opportunity to read that letter as well. And before I get to your direct question, I, I did want to make a couple comments about that letter in general. It goes to show that our industry needs to continue to educate the Bureau, 
the consumer side and Congress about what it is we do and how we do it. We are always focused on treating consumers fairly with professionalism and respect, and we always want to do things right. There is a perception that some of the things we do that I believe is a little bit inaccurate. So some of that letter, unfortunately, addresses some of their beliefs or perception about default judgments and being obtained with unsubstantiated information. And we all know the courts are efficient and effective. And when default judgments are granted, there is evidence required, the consumer has an opportunity to defend, and then the courts are properly issuing those as well. So in terms of their focus on even, for example, lawyers needing to be held to a higher standard, we already know that attorneys are held to a higher standard. We are governed by the Supreme Courts of our states, and we focus on being ethical and compliant at all times when engaging with a consumer, because our purposes for engaging that consumer is to obtain resolution. Brings me back to the limited content message inquiry that you're making. And at this stage, for me and for I think many in the industry, We're happy to see that as a safe harbor guideline. We've been talking about that for a long time. We all want to follow the rules of the road. We all want to do best practices when engaging in debt collections and working with consumers. So as many in our membership and industry know, there was a case back in 2006 called the Fody case out of New York, and it had to do with how a voice message was left. Was it in violation of fair debt or not based on interpretations of that statute? Over the years, there have been a lot of cases that have developed around that line that basically is questioning when you leave a voicemail, do you have to leave it a certain way with very limited information in it? Or if you don't leave enough information, are you not providing the mini Miranda required to be a communication for a consumer? And then the anti fody side of that saying, well, if you leave it in there with the mini Miranda and identifying yourself as a duck collector, Has the person now just done a third-party communication, which is also in violation of fair debt? So then many in our industry are grappling with how do we address this for using this type of communication opportunity? So some even stopped leaving voicemails. They thought it wasn't the right way to go. But then there has been some cases that even focused on the fact, well, if you didn't leave a message, but I saw the number several times on caller ID, could that be deemed harassment in trying to contact a consumer? We want rules to help us guide how to do things properly and appropriately in accordance with the law. So the concepts of safe harbor have been around for a long time to kind of bring all of this case law into focus. And so the limited content message is an attempt at that. It's an attempt at the CFPB to provide us with that guidance and sort of that safe harbor that if you follow it based on how they've written it in the rules, this particular message will not be deemed a communication. And therefore, it will not leave you to a certain exposure that many of us have been fighting over the last several years. The limited content message is an opportunity to engage that consumer. We're attempting to communicate with them. We want it to be an interactive process. So hopefully, the benefit that I see, based on your question, is if you get one of these messages and the consumer picks up the phone and returns the call, they won't have as many messages or as much contact from the debt collector that they deem to be a concern for them because it gives them a chance to interact with us and probably have less touches on that file if they respond to that limited content message. Anything that's going to give us a safe harbor guideline that we believe the industry as a whole can follow, I think is a benefit. And I think they're in the right direction with that. But it goes back to your point about the comments. The industry needs to comment on what they've done with the limited content message. Are the pieces that they're asking you to put into the message appropriate? The optional pieces, do we need something more? We can maybe reference account. Can we reference our account number? At this time, they're saying no. Personal business matter, that used to be a phrase that was used in the past. People are being asked to talk about and weigh in on what works and what doesn't work, in our opinion, based on that limited content message. But I think a safe harbor approach is very good, and I think it helps the consumer to engage in the interactive process with a very benign type message that allows us to reach out to them to try and engage in that resolution process. I think it's, you know, Eileen's point, it's great. I think it's good for consumers. I mean, they were getting all these, you know, because part of the reaction was, I don't want to get sued because do I use Foidy? Do I use Zordman? And so a lot of people just started dialing and not leaving any message at all. And then that doesn't help the consumer at all. It doesn't let them know who's contacting them. Sometimes it's difficult to track down the 800 numbers. It's just effort on their part. And to be able to leave some level, uh, some message, it's going to not get you sued is a huge step 
forward for us. And I agree that we need to t talk about from a comments perspective things that we want to be able to give to the consumer so they know who's calling, why we're calling, uh, what information we can give them. And so that safe harbor, I think, is a great step forward for the consumer. Just to follow up with what Tim just said and what we've all been talking about is consumers want options. And with modern technology, as Tim was talking about with the email concept, we now know the limited content message. I mentioned a lot about voicemail, but can be done by text. And so the consumers want the opportunity to be communicated with in a manner that makes sense for them, for them to be able to respond when appropriate and how they want to engage. So I think that this is not only the safe harbor concept, but also the fact that we are engaging additional technology is a very good benefit for the consumer. I agree. I think it's interesting. I had a meeting with our operations team this week talking about this going forward and recruiting some new employees and thinking about the employees who may be rather than just call center type operation, but, but texting back and forth with the consumer and really engaging in, in more modern communication platforms and techniques. And I think we'll probably see that moving forward. Tim, your point makes a great transition into this question and the developments going on at the FCC and the declaratory ruling that required default opt-out blocking in their call blocking and procedures at the carrier level rather than an opt-in blocking. Additionally, the ruling states that reasonable analytics for blocking include things that very clearly can sweep in legitimate calls such as our debt collection calls and certainly the process of calling and not leaving a return number to call would pull them into that analytic. Uh, do you think this has any impact on areas of the CFPB rule? I think it does, Jack. Email's been around for a long time. And in the old days, we used to get all of this spam that would come in. We don't see those today. The reason we don't see them is because the Internet service providers, Google, Yahoo, SN, all of those folks have put in these blocking tools. Those emails still exist because we get them from time to time. One will sneak through every now and then. And now we're going to see that apply to phone calls. And my fear is, is that phone calls that from, from our organizations in this industry are not even going to show up in a voicemail. They're just not even going to make it. Because when you talk about reasonable analytics, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, if you look at it, if you apply email analytics as an example, if you send a lot of emails at one time, you're automatically considered high risk. If you want to send emails, you have to do it over a process. You start off with sending a few thousand one day, and then you can double that number the next day and double that number the next day. I don't see it from a collection agency perspective really having that level of sophistication yet. What a phone service provider could see is all of a sudden, you know, we fire up our, our daily, you know, dialer uh, campaigns, and they start seeing a lot of phone calls going to a lot of people. That looked like spam in email. That could look like you know, illegal phone calls from whoever. And so my concern is, is that it's not even going to make it through. And how do we know? I mean, how are we going to know that piece that it doesn't go through? We'll see that, of course, on the back end. Collection agencies should have analytics in place right now to be able to look at it and say, okay, is this number being compromised? If we're not seeing enough right party contacts or even people answering the phone, we should be able to see that pretty quickly. But having that piece built is going to be crucial going forward. And then my concern is if they do it for, if they're going to do it for phone numbers, they're definitely going to do it for text. It's going to come at some point in the future where, because I think a lot of people are going to, once phone numbers become ineffective, they're going to move to the next spot where they can be effective. These are the people that are, that are illegally making phone calls and illegally sending texts. They will have no choice but to go to the text messaging. And so we'll see the same thing happen again, Jack, that we're seeing right now with the phones. They'll have to be reasonable analytics. You're going to have to you know, block. Most of them probably won't go through, and we have to work through that process. And I think that's why it's so important for us as an industry to have these other channels, whether that's email, whether that's direct messaging through any one of those others, whether it's a Facebook direct message, Twitter direct messaging, Instagram. I'm not sure Snapchat, we can get there from a compliance perspective, <laughs> but um, someday probably. <laughs> you know, so we're going to have to have all those other channels, and then we're really going to have to invest in our websites, right? So can consumers can find us and they can do things on the website the way maybe we've done in the past over the phone. 
we just have to create all the channels we possibly can, assuming that at some point we may lose the ability to send phone calls and we have to go back and fix that. And that process takes time. And, and we can't be down for days. We have to be able to be calling consumers every single day. It's going to be an interesting process, but I think the CPD coming out with this and, and saying, look, email is good, text is good, and these other channels, as long as they're not to the public, these are all good. We just need to figure out how we can set that up from a systems perspective and do it in a compliant way that's good for the consumer. Yeah, I think you make a great point there. When you talk about the various messaging platforms and, and what we can and can't do, my kids constantly remind me I'm about six months to a year behind all of the current technology that's out, even though I think I'm up to date with it. And, you know, I think when we're looking at the rules and our technology, it's difficult, but we shouldn't limit ourselves to what technology is available today, but also think about what might be coming out down the road as well. Well, at this point, you know, ACA is in the process of receiving feedback from membership in various forms as we put together our comments to make sure that we provide detailed feedback to the CFPB about our thoughts on the proposal. Are there any issues that either of you encourage everyone to think about that we have not yet discussed? Tim, I'll open it up to you first. From our perspective, obviously, we're we're heavy on the email side. We send out our uh, initial letter, our validation letters done via email. There's now this additional requirement about e-sign and having e-sign compliance to be able to do that. I think that's an expansion of the e-sign. E-sign is triggered when you have a federally required notice go out, such as a payment reminder. Some say through the dispute process, the validation notice is due within five days after the initial contact. But what happens if it's in the initial communication to the consumer already? Uh, I don't think e-sign is there triggered. So one of the things that we're really focusing on is making sure that there's not this expansion and really helping our clients make sure that they have that e-sign requirements that are in there. It's interesting that e-sign used to be cutting edge law and it's now dated. It needs to be updated itself. So in the CFPB's expansion, doesn't help us with the ability to communicate effectively with consumers. A lot of consumers, especially those in debt, uh, are moving uh, quite a bit. Sometimes the mail doesn't catch up to them in a timely fashion. They're not getting their rights. Uh, email doesn't have those restrictions. So that's one of the areas we're really focused on is making sure that, that it's not required in every single communication that you have that you sign requirement. Great information there, Tim. Eileen, do you have any other thoughts? Actually, following up different aspect of the validation notice, I think uh, what Tim said is fantastic because we are all looking forward to the opportunity to send even more email than we have in the past and do it in a compliant manner. What we are focused on is, again, going back to that phrase, safe harbor. The CFPB rules have given us a validation notice, an actual document that they're trying to say, if you follow this notice with this content, this will also be deemed a safe harbor. And we are encouraging um, everyone to look at that very closely to make sure that the validation notice is in a format that works for you. Definitely comment. Say what works, what doesn't work, what maybe should also be considered a little bit further. Obviously, it has the 1692G validation verification notice that we're all used to from Fair Debt. And we've had Fair Debt guidance for years with certain requirements, but now their rules are adding an additional aspect to this validation notice that allows the consumer to give a response and tell the debt collector certain things about whether they dispute the debt, whether they think it's already paid, whether they want to know additional information. That additional requirement in the validation notice has to be looked at to make sure it's being incorporated and that the information being shared now is in a little bit more of a plain language approach in how they've set up the notice. But even for us, for example, we notice there's no field that has the date, the actual date the notice was issued. There's new dates on there. There's the date for when you can ask for your verification validation with your 30 days by adding the five days in that they're suggesting. And there's the date with regard to the itemization date of the four that you can choose from. The actual date of the notice, we didn't see a field for that. And practical, that's important to us for showing our client requirements that we've gotten it out in time and being able to um, track our communications in terms of when we're sending that validation notice out, whether it's electronic, and that date may make a difference about what your validation response date is or whether you're doing it through paper mail. We encourage people to, again, take advantage of the safe harbor opportunities that they're providing and look 
to see how we can get enhanced guidelines from that because, again, we all invest in compliance. We're all focused on best practices and trying to get to that resolution with the consumer. So we really don't want to limit access to the population we're trying to help, right? So some of these new triggers with regards to the number of calls and the fact that you can reach out via email and text is going to be beneficial to the consumer, but we have to make sure we continue to educate everyone on the fact that it is beneficial to engage with that consumer in an interactive process at an early stage in the hopes of possibly resolving and addressing the matter prior to having to get to a lawsuit. We really see lawsuits as last resort. We're trying to engage at an early stage with our validation notice or with a limited content message call or a phone call interacting with that consumer to see what we can do to get things addressed for them and for our clients. We encourage, as you have all mentioned so far today, to review the 500 plus pages take an opportunity to look at the comments that the CFPB has asked you to comment on and weigh in on the ones that are significant to you, not only for the industry, which ACA is doing so well, but also, as you said, for members individually to have their voice and their message heard. Thank you so much, Tim and Eileen, for your comments today. Uh, while there's still a lot more to the rules than what we talked about today, I think we were able to peel back at least one layer to that and really appreciate your input and comments here today. Thank you, everyone. Before we close today, I'd like to remind everyone that news and information related to the accounts receivable management industry is covered extensively in Collector Magazine and in ACA's daily electronic newsletter, which are both available on our website at www.acinternational.org. This podcast and ACA's other podcasts are available on ACA's website or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Thank you and have a great day. 